<laughs> Good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Good? Okay, good. All right. Welcome to the live in-person and live Zoom worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Riverside. Our opening hymn this morning is number 318, We Would Be One, from the Gray Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but please with your masks on. Now please stand in body or spirit, in spirit and join us in singing number 318, We Would Be One, from the Gray Hymnal. Thank you for joining us here in person, and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for all of our virtual attendees. I'm Grace Preuss, a member of the Worship Committee, and I will be your worship associate today. Other members of the Worship Committee you will hear from include Alec Peck, who is leading us in our hymns, and also giving our lay-led sermon this morning. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart. And with muted electronic devices, please. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are in the sanctuary, please keep your masks on and remember to be aware and socially distance. Before we move into the service, there are a few announcements we would like to share. We will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. 
At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all of this information, and it is also available on our website. Sharing joys and concerns. Sharing joys and concerns is one of the most important rituals in our community. An opportunity to share milestones, losses, achievements, and experiences with one another. Now that our doors are open again, on the first Sunday of each month, we can hear from those in the sanctuary and read the contributions that we have received. In front of the pulpit, oh, is there a book here? Could I? In front of the pulpit, there's usually a book where you can write your joys and concerns whenever you are here, um, when the spirit moves you. It's here in the sanctuary. And if you don't see it, you can ask. <laughs> For those of you at home, you can send your joys and concerns throughout the month to uuchurchofriverside at gmail.com. Thank you, Alec. And that's our book. You're welcome to write whatever joys and concerns you may have, um, and we'll share them on the first Sunday. Our next joys and concerns will be on November 6th. The monthly newsletter. The newsletter comes out every first of every, comes out first, the first of every other month. So please send your articles to Kate at treasurer at uuchurchofriverside.org. Look for the next newsletter at the beginning of November. Linda and Kate are looking for people to help oh, at the beginning of November. Okay, so the next announcement is for the yard sale. Linda and Kate are looking for people to help with the yard sale beginning Thursday, November 3rd through Saturday, November 5th. We will be setting up in the parish hall on Thursday. The yard sale itself will be both Friday and Saturday with the packing up on Saturday afternoon. Please see Linda. Is Linda here today? Please see Linda. If you can help out on any of these days, even if it's for an hour or two, we'd appreciate that. Okay, so once again, the setup is Thursday, November 3rd. Friday and Saturday, November 4th and 5th um, is the sale um, between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. Is that right, Linda? Okay, and 6 a.m.? Wow. <laughs> okay, so who, any brave souls that want to show up on Friday at 6 a.m., it would be greatly appreciated. Yes. Um, and that would be later. Um, the sale usually starts at seven. Um, you're welcome to arrive at eight and it ends at three. So we need people during those hours to help take money. So let me know. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for your help. Okay. And then finally, we have the big sale today. Um, the third week is the sweetest week of the month here at UUCR. After the service, there will be a bake sale in the parish hall. Pick up your favorites. All donations will be contributed to the general church fund. The social and environmental justice committee meeting is today in the annex at 12 noon, at 12 noon. You can find the Zoom link and more information on the website under social and environmental justice. Any additional announcements for us, Adam? No. All right. So now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. You are welcome to read with me the mission statement of our church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Today, our speaker is UUCR member, Alec Peck. 
Alec has been a practicing UU for 24 years, raised in a UU church, chosen by his father, who was raised Quaker, and his mother, who was raised Jewish, although both are humanist in practice. Alec has studied natural science at Crichton University, a Jesuit institution, and is now completing his PhD at UC Riverside, while serving as chair of the worship committee here at UUCR. Our sermon today is entitled, Beloved Community. According to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., beloved community happens when everyone is cared for, absent of poverty, hunger, and hate. To feel accepted is not only for our uniqueness to be respected by those around us. It is also feeling that it is good and right that you are who you are and who you want to be. It is to see welcoming arms no matter what path you choose, to be unburdened by the constraint of expectations. To forge our beloved community, we must recognize injustice, which keeps people from embracing their full potential. Now we have the lightings of our sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Temple, a candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original people of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred place of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Cahuilla, the Cupeño, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light the sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Now we have the lighting of our own sacred flame and today's reading for the chalice lighting is written by Martin Luther King. Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. The aftermath of the fight with fire method is bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the love method is reconciliation and creation of the beloved community. Phys physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, and destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies, is a solution to the race problem. Experimental wick. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but they play. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Apparently it works. All right. <laughs> our next segment is greeting our guests. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. And so I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic in the front and speak into it directly and clearly so everyone can hear. However, please be aware that you will be visible on our Zoom camera and in the recording of this service, which is posted online. Do we have any church members who would like to volunteer today? Maggie? Thank you, Maggie.
Um, hi, I'm Maggie, and I'm especially moved to share this morning, <laughs> which I usually am reluctant to do, um, because of the hymn we sang this morning. The hymn that we sang this morning was written by Samuel Anthony Wright. He was my first UU minister back when I was in high school. And I just want to say that because it just does my heart good. I know he's passed away now. He was in his 90s when he passed. Um, <laughs> I'm in my 80s, <laughs> not far behind. Um, I, just, I just want to say that really moved me that we sang that. So I have been a UU off and on since high school. And, um, I, but I came to this church when I moved to Redlands, <clears throat> when I retired and found out that this was the closest UU church to me. And I am uh, so glad to have found it. I've been to various UU churches in the different cities I've lived in and uh, each is unique. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. And that's how it's done. So if you are new here, a visitor or an old friend, please raise your hand to stand and come up to the mic in front of the pulpit. Do we have any people who'd like to introduce themselves? Come on up. Welcome. Hello, um, and thank you for the warm welcome so far. We've um, both felt, me and Emily, we're friends, just came to check out your church. Um, we found it just on Google, Google, I guess. We looked for the closest Unitarian church, um, or the closest UU church that we're learning to say now. Um, and we really like a lot of the practices and the, the values you guys are sharing. So um, we appreciate just kind of the warm welcome and everything you guys are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we're from, from also from Redlands, Loma Linda, um, but we spent a lot of time in Redlands as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for joining us. Is there anyone else out there in the audience like to come up? Okay. Um, see if there's someone online who'd like to introduce themselves, please raise your hand and we'll call you on Zoom. Please let us know who you are, where you are from, and how you found out about us. For any other new guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you out in the parish hall where you can find a visitor's book. And you can leave your name before you leave so that we know you are here and leave your contact information if you'd like to know more about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Our hymn now is number 123, Spirit of Life, from the Gray Hymnal. Please feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but again, only with your masks on. Now please stand, embody your spirit, and join us in singing number 123, Spirit of Life.
sharing our stewardship. This portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church. This can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here. You may also contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is shown here, as well as on the church website and in the newsletter. Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater grocery cards, which we will have in church each Sunday. You get the full value and the church also receives a percentage for free. Please see our treasurer to purchase the gift cards. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Will our ushers now please come forward to receive the collection? Our next hymn is number 402, From You I Receive, from the Gray Hymnal. Again, please feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but with your masks on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 402, From You I Receive. Our meditation today is by Natasha Trethaway, and we will hear it read by Natasha herself. The words will be displayed. Southern History. Before the war, they were happy, he said, quoting our textbook. This was senior year history class. The slaves were clothed, fed, and better off under a master's care. I watched the words blur on the page. No one raised a hand, disagreed, not even me. It was late. We still had reconstruction to cover before the test, and, luckily, three hours of watching Gone with the Wind. History, the teacher said, of the Old South, a true account of how things were back then. On screen, a slave stood big as life, big mouth, bucked eyes, our textbooks grinning proof, a lie my teacher guarded. Silent, so did I.
Now let us pause for a moment of silence to reflect on these words. Now I would like to introduce Alec Peck, who will be speaking to us on Beloved Community. Alec? Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> I was thinking about that lyric from our hymn this morning, and thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us, Maggie. Uh, that first lyric, uh, we would be one now as we join in singing our hymn of love to pledge ourselves anew to that high cause of greater understanding of who we are and what in us is true. This is a song about self-acceptance, but it's more also about a, a song about self-discovery what is it that makes us who we are? What in us is inherent and what in us is essential? In Buddhist philosophy, there is no freedom that is possible unless we can understand the interdependence and belonging that we all share. All that we know and everything that we have learned comes from our life experience and that experience was guided very intentionally by the, everyone around us, our parents, our community, our friends. And we have unaware made a complicated and interconnected web between everyone that we've come in contact with. This is our community. Every single person that we have touched is part of the tapestry of our lives. And why is community so vital to leading a full spiritual life? And why is our understanding our place in it vital to being a good person? We understand the identity of others through our perception of them. And of course, the same is true for us. <clears throat> how we end, well, how our, so our, <clears throat> our concept of identity is formed not only from how we are being perceived, but also how we think we're being perceived, our very expectations on how we think we should behave, what we think society expects of us. This is our social self. It's defined by our performance. Beauty, of course, is in the eye of the beholder, but so are many other social traits, confidence, rudeness, friendliness, just as meaning of our artistic performances is drawn not only from what we imbue with it, but also from what others see in our art, so too is our social performance and our social self. We have a primal desire to be connected to one another, of course. And this is because we evolve from a social species. The primal mood of separation and of the separate self is fear. The degree to which you feel separate is the degree to which you feel fear. And that boundary between yourself and between others is a survival mechanism of defending and hoarding part of our upbringing. And when those boundaries that we create prevent our social connections, then we start to see people as unreal. When we are separate from them, we do not see them as a real person, not a real other. And what would it be like to feel uh, beloved and to feel radially accepted that for every thread in the tapestry that connects you to everyone else, you can feel love in every direction. To be able to surrender our ego boundaries 
to risk spiritual growth for everyone around us, a radial acceptance, an acceptance that points in all directions. This is the essence of a beloved community where we can all see each other for who we are and we can live without shame. We can be free to follow who we are in our hearts. It can be as simple perhaps as just how I choose to dress. Maybe I didn't really want to wear something because I didn't want to be judged. But is that what I really wanted? It kind of seems like I really wanted to wear it, but I didn't because I feel a pressure an outside force. A beloved community is a tapestry which is interwoven with love and nonviolence, where the pressures of society are only to be ourselves and to be our better selves. But this is not the form that today's society has taken. Some people only value themselves, some people only value their in-group, those people that they consider to be like them, or at least enough like them. In the past few centuries, there has been a significant benefit to outing a certain group of people, because whether you are in the in-group or the out-group can make a pretty significant difference on how you live your life. And if you can be an outer, then maybe the new can be in the in-group. For instance, there is a long sorted history of Irish Americans out in, uh, <clears throat> choosing to other black communities in order to perhaps become a part of the white community that at that time they were not considered to be a part of, or perhaps to better align with the politics of that group that they already agreed with, largely coming from a Roman, from a, an Irish Catholic background, or perhaps simply to reduce their economic competition. But what happens when other people are unreal? They become more two-dimensional, like characters on a page in a book, and they just resemble the idea of a person. And we don't have to think about their well-being or what they think. But where did this need to form in groups come from? It didn't come from nowhere. It is very recent. Again, only the last few centuries, our experience that our grandparents had very different lifestyles than ours. This is a very new phenomenon. For tens of thousands of years after the first humans left Africa and were in small groups of hunter gatherers, groups of dozens of people at the most, these people were socially trained that it is a life or death experience to be able to recognize whether someone is in your in-group or your out-group. That is so many generations that made it an, which has made it an inherent part of our society. Inherent, but not essential. Our protective barriers, uh, this self that we feel as a group, also prevents us from seeing other people. And they have their own barriers too. But when you yourself are in a deep hole, you cannot see anything. But why is it that race has come to be the system through which these groupings and oppressions are made? Why has race become the dominant injustice which impacts people the most? Although there are other, certainly other axes of oppression and why is race the thing that people feel so strongly that they cannot be represented across? The well-known now Tulsa race massacre occurred when the Black Wall Street was burned down, an inciting incident being the dubious arrest of a black man. But Tulsa was chosen as the target as a representation of black success. The replacement conspiracy an idea among white people is that the share of white power is diminishing because of course they couldn't possibly be represented or break bread as neighbors with a black person. A less violent example perhaps, Disney recently has been in a habit of remaking their beloved classic animations as live action movies, 
mostly reaching not very positive uh, reception. But recently, The Little Mermaid has made its uh, trailer uh, online and re has received a massive initial backlash, and especially massive compared to these other equally trashy remakes. Uh, and some of it is quite obviously direct racism due to the fact that they've made uh, the main character, The Little Mermaid, in the live version is now black. But perhaps there's a conscious or also unconscious expression of dislike for other supposed reasons, uh, perhaps some unconscious biases that make them think that this is no longer a movie that can represent them because they can see a black face in it. And I didn't have to go very far to find a racially motivated injustice in the news. This morning I saw, published yesterday, the title, Cops Dismissed Abducted Black Woman Rumor Before Victim's Basement Escape. I have no doubt that if a white community had come with the same concerns of a missing young woman, there would be potentially national news stories about a search for the missing white woman. And, but maybe it's just a coincidence uh, that no missing persons report got filed in this particular instance, that no policeman in that uh, unit happened to care enough to help. Sorry, I've lost my place. Um, oppression <clears throat> or exclusion hurts. It hurts our soul. And so, and because we are, and this is because we are social creatures. And as social creatures, we protect our in group. In those 10,000s of years after our dispersal out of Africa, those first few million people where they had a very strong similarity, which had to do with their geographic location, and thus similar cultures related to that, and thus, of course, similar ideas. And race today is a complicated expression of culture, heritage, and a wide variation of physical adaptions, which occurred during that diaspora. And even a half century, really not that long ago, after Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches, there is still a strong cultural divide between Black and white Americans. Science has a very similar problem to the UU Church in that we say that we don't care about race, but then why is it that no Black people want to be physicists? Why is it that Black numbers in UU churches are so sparse? And if we suppose that these students do have a choice in the career path that they want, you might be tempted to say that they don't want to be physicists. And sure, perhaps, certainly some people, it is not in their temperament to be physicists. I certainly don't think most people uh, have that in their temperament, uh, but perhaps some of them really wanted it. That is, perhaps if they had had more freedom uh, then perhaps they would have chosen that path. Just like I don't think women don't really like walking in secluded, uh, really don't dislike walking in secluded and unmonitored areas at night, not because this is the natural temperament of women, but because they have adapted to the social environment that they are in. Certain people, mostly men, have made it quite unpleasant for women to seek out these particular circumstances. And what if they had more freedom? What if their personhood was more well-respected? What choices would we all make? Physical threats are a very clear and potent example, but what if someone chooses not to join a dance club or a church or pursue their career because that option was made to seem unappealing? You don't actually have to do or say anything bad, you simply have to imply that it might happen. Some people, and I think most, have some kind of fear of judgment, and the threat of judgment can be enough. To be American means to be white. Everyone else have to hype it, has to hyphenate. Black American, Asian American, but would you ever consider calling yourself a European American? or a white American? What happens when God and Adam and Eve and Jesus are all white? 
what happens when every physicist on the wall of my physics building is all, are they are all white. We do not live in a vacuum. We live in a world where we have a history of racial violence, a history of white hierarchy, and coming to terms with our personal race and our relationship to racism is very different for white and black Americans and for each race of Americans. Most of us have an idea of what it means to be white or not white in the sense of whether or not our friends or we are in or out of the in-group, but what does it mean for our social selves? Our lived social self is defined by those connections of the social fabric. It is easy to assume that our experience of that social fabric, our experience of community is the same as everyone else's. But stand up for what you believe in is only easy to say when you have felt support your life. Be, to be demand to be treated fairly is something you can only tell your children when you have come to expect fairness. Live without fear is only good advice when your existence is not under threat. The trauma of being an oppressor is the white trauma, and we have a collective identity which is very hard to see. And the white privilege is that feeling when you have felt have gone for a swim and found it very difficult only to look back and find that you were going with the current the whole time. The racial hierarchy is a tool to drive people apart. And it is a tool which is only good for people who only value themselves. For us to come together as a beloved community requires reconciliation. To acknowledge our past traumas and to find each other again. Beloved community is to be aware of our social identity and its impact on all of our relationships. We can reconcile when only when we are able to speak with dignity and speak with the courage to feel our shame. We can reconcile when we become, when we welcome people as people, each of us as vibrant and complex and unique. How many conversations have we not had and what a terrible loss it is for each of us. I'll wrap up now mostly with words that aren't mine from Martin Luther King Jr.'s Justice Without Violence. There are certain things we can say about this method that seeks justice without violence. It does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win their friendship and understanding. I think that this is one of the basic distinguishing points between violence and nonviolence. The ultimate end of violence is to defeat the opponent. The ultimate end of nonviolence is to win the friendship of the opponent. It is necessary to boycott sometimes, but the nonviolent register uh, realized, that, <clears throat> realized that boycott is never an end within itself but merely a means to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. There is a method that seeks to transform and to redeem and win the friendship of the opponent and make it possible for us to live together as brothers and sisters in a community and not continually live with bitterness and friction. And from his speech, the role of the church in facing the nation's chief moral dilemma in the same year, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of a beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform oppressors into friends the type of love that I stress here is not Eros, 
a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all people. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of man. It is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. The legacy of slavery in our country, the legacy of our culture is very particular. The effort to know our place comes from the pain which we have to face and the pain of accepting that perhaps we have been blind to others' experiences. Beloved community is the end goal where people can be who they are in their hearts, where we have the self-awareness of our place in society, where we can dismantle the unjust hierarchies that we ourselves have built. It's easy to find fake Einstein quotes online, so here's a real one for you, given to the president of the World Jewish Congress who had recently lost his son to polio. Translated roughly from German, of course. A human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. The experiences themselves, their thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to, aff and to affection for but few persons near us to us. Our task must to be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. We must come to recognize the tapestry of our social connections and our place in it, our impact on it. We must come to recognize what our impact is on other people's social self. To be morally balanced and spiritually sound, we must come to respect what in each of us is inherently true. But that is not all that we must do. To be whole, we must also journey on this, take a journey of self-discovery. But that is not all that we must do. Spiritual wholeness is achieved only with the whole self, which includes the social self. Spiritual wholeness is when we each, uh, <clears throat> when we know each part of our one self. Spiritual wholeness is when we know that each, each part and each role that we play in society, and when we know how each part of each of us is a part of the one whole earth. Thank you. Amen, namaste, blessed be. Our closing hymn now is number 151, I Wish I Knew How, from the Gray Hymnal. Please feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but with your masks on. Please stand in body or in spirit and join us in singing number 151, I Wish I Knew How. Thank you. 
Our benediction today is by Glenn Thomas Rideout. If you don't seek it, you won't see it. I'm gonna build my own foundation. You won't break my soul. When it was his turn to present his history project to our seventh grade class, he began with delight, flashing a large poster board and permanent marker family tree. He'd been able to trace his ancestors back to the 1500s I wonder how he managed to discover so much and so many. I tried something like that a year before. I asked every adult in my family. Stayed in the local library for so long, they gave me a job at the desk. I combed the internet looking for something of my deeper heritage so that I could imagine myself. He was talking about his German ancestors. I remember feeling confusion. I had no idea where he was getting this information about his great, great, great grandparents. I looked around me and none of the other black kids in the classroom seemed to have a clue either. We don't have those stories. Ultimately, I realized that my white classmate had access to time that I didn't have, access to stories and connections that I could never have. Like most black people, I rise on the shoulders of ancestors whose names I cannot know. Our ability to move through our own past is, in, uh, is encumbered, cut off at the point where we as human beings are sold like cargo, the point of erasure. In order to shackle people to ships, you have to untether them from their life stories and their heritage, their bloodlines and their land and their homes. You do all of this untethering and for the rest of the generations of that person, for the rest of that time, there will be no knowing of their stories. If from the beginning of racism and this human trafficking, the point was to build a country with people imprisoned and kept in their economic states, then the only way for America, for all of her people, to get any sort of free together is to act as if these stolen stories truly exist, to replace habits that encumber the movement and liberation of our kindred to remember even the lives for which we now know no names. We show our children now the truths of yesterday and the possibility of tomorrow. It's this deeper connection with the greater living story that brings a chance of wellness and repair for all life. God, continue to fashion my people in our ancestors' image so that we may glimpse their stories in each other's eyes 
and trace over the marks of erasure in bold, provocative joy. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Alec, for sharing your valuable time and insights with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated, and we look forward to seeing you again. For those of you who wish to stay, we can have 10 to 15 minutes of discussion and observations following the service to share our thoughts on today's topic. Please be aware that this will be included on the video that is posted. For the others who do not wish to participate, you're welcome to adjourn to the parish hall. Thank you. anyone has any comments that they'd like to share, um, then now is the time. Otherwise, we can go for coffee hour. Um, but I'd love to hear any of your comments. Morning, Walt. Uh, talking about uh... Group, accept, group acceptance and stereotyping amongst peoples. When I got out of college, my parents' friends in San Francisco were kind of watching over me as I was navigating that city. They suggest that I should cut my long hair to get a job. Before that, I would go downtown and wander freely, ride the cable car and have a great time. After I actually did go and get my hair cut, I stepped out of the apartment and started to go down to the familiar downtown area. And I could feel the vibration, the eyes. I no longer fit the street. I was in such great shock that I went back to my apartment and stayed there. Meanwhile, my mother got worried about me and told my dad to fly down and fetch me back. So that ended my stay in San Francisco, back to the farm in North Idaho. Thank you. Yes, Bill, thank you. Oh, and then we'll have Grace, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, race is always a, a difficult and um, complicated uh, topic. And it's very encouraging to see that the conversation is getting louder right now. Building off of what uh, Grace just said, uh, it's, uh, well, maybe because we're Unitarian Universalists, I think one of the things, you know, you, you spoke uh, uh, earlier about, oh, Blacks don't want to be physicists, that that quick little patch is going, well, there's a batch of people we don't have to provide funding for. So there was that. But there was also the idea that happens when you hear music that just like from a different culture that uh, once translated just hits you right there in the middle of your soul. I think being uh, a spiritual person means I got a selection of parts, you know, how I was raised, how I'm currently making my living and so on. But I should always be a little bit more than those parts, some sort of synergy should be there. 
And so you ask awkward questions like, uh, why are there no, uh, why are there fewer black physicists? How come the uh, route with all the smoggy trucks always goes through uh, the neighborhoods with uh, no money? I think that it might be a spiritual practice to ask awkward questions and then to resolve them with as much kindness as possible because we do have an advantage. People aren't gonna drop an N-bomb the way they used to. So that simple question of why could produce just an incredible amount of good work. I think I've said enough. So if there are no more comments, then uh, Adam, anyone online who, just making sure. Uh, in that case, thank you all for spending this extra time with us to, to discuss and we can have some more casual chit chat out in the parish hall. Thanks everybody. Thanks.